Hello again, and welcome to the Amateur Ages podcast, uh, where two guys do their best to explain uh, the world's history. I'm Martin Van Coy, a.k.a. Causey, joined by Jeff S. Tier Blagden. And uh, yes, you guessed it. Today, we're doing a tier list of ancient kingdoms and dynasties. And I uh, have to say uh, up front that prepping for this uh, was a challenge. We have about 25 empires to get through here, uh, but we will be brief and try our best to explain why we think they belong where they do. Uh, You are, of course, welcome to dispute our choices in the comments. uh, But when it comes to the criteria, I'm going to let Jeff explain things. Uh, But quickly, if you enjoy this podcast, hit that like button and subscribe. And uh, Jeff. Thank you so much for joining me once again for a dive through the ages. Uh, How is this tier list going to shake down? Yeah, uh, wouldn't miss it for the world. Um, Yeah, so we have, (laughs) like he said, uh, there was a lot of research that that went into this. uh, And like he said, we are amateur historians. So don't beg us too hard on on these uh, uh, on where we land on these things. It is a lot of opinion based stuff on our ends. Um, We picked 25 empires to start with and then had to eliminate one so we got 24 that we're ranking today um the criteria that we tried to stick with uh, as much as we could was to keep it between the year zero uh and the year 1700 of the common era now there are some spots where we had to bend the rules a little bit for example the roman empire started in the year 27 bce it stretched into the year 476 so most of its existence was after the year zero so we decided to (laughs) include it in the list because the most relevant parts of its existence were in our range and because it lasted so long and also i mean the roman empire you can't leave off a tier list of empires it's it's where the word came from yeah so yeah (laughs) it's the empire yeah so um (laughs) So yeah, we we uh, we tried to stick as much as we could to that criteria. Now another key note is that these aren't necessarily the twenty five greatest empires of all time. We took twenty five significant empires or twenty four significant empires, and mm-hmm. chose between which ones we were going to include on the list. And a reason for that, and a reason we didn't just go with the the twenty five best ones or the twenty four best ones, is sometimes that could get a little boring because we could end up having a lot of really good rankings and on top of that a lot of similarities between the things that we're ranking for example um we were talking about it before some of the the east asian dynasties or the 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 chinese dynasties ruled the same amount of territory and sort of bridged off of what the ones that came before them did so rather than ranking Mm -hmm. each individual one we kind of picked a range right we picked good ones and we picked some some in the middle in that so yeah. i will note if you want to see us rank more empires and such i mean i i would be willing and open to do another list at some point in the future so if you want to leave suggestions below of empires that you want us to include maybe in a future tier list or something uh feel free to do so and we can look into those as well yeah and of course uh if you have a place or time period you want to suggest uh, tell us what tier you think it would belong in as well yeah, exactly so but for now we tried to stick as much as we could between the year zero uh and the year 1700 of the common era uh some went a little over some went a little under but they were largely still within that range of time um yeah. So that was our criteria on how we went about this. And we're going to rank yeah. them into a standard tier list. Uh, we got S tier, we got A tier, we got B tier, we got C tier, and we got D tier. Um, so, yeah, you're the standard list that everyone's used to. Yeah, and uh, uh, the, a big thing to note, too, is we're not picking these in any particular order. It's uh, going to be done through a randomizer. Uh, so don't be upset, you know, because we don't mention the Roman Empire up front, right? <laughs> Yeah, you're going to have to, uh, rather than doing it alphabetically where you could just jump to a timestamp, no, 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 you're going to have to listen to the whole thing. (laughs) Yep, yep, sorry, you got to (laughs) suffer. All right, so uh, I have all of our 24 empires keyed in here to my randomizer, and I'm going to click and see what the number, well, not the number one, but our first empire that we're ranking is, and it is 
the Mali Empire. The Mali Empire. Oh, fascinating. I This is one of the ones I'm actually the most curious about where you're going to rank it. For everyone that's that doesn't... Re- we, we haven't shared with each other what our rankings are going into this. So this is just as much a surprise uh, yeah. to, to each of us as it is to you guys. And what we're going to try to do is convince each other where we want our official rank to be so do you want to just go back and forth then may i'll i'll say my ranking first on this one and then the next one you can maybe counterpoint like we'll go back and forth i guess yeah i i I, like i said i'm interested to hear for the mali empire uh where or your justification for for where you put them on the board because i feel like this is one that can be very split yeah all right so i think i'll start by kind of summarizing why they were kind of picked. So the Mali Empire is uh, located in West Africa, and uh, they had a 375-year reign from uh, 1235 to 1610 uh, CE, and they had a pretty big population of 50 million people, and they also hold the claim to fame as being one of the richest empires ever, which is uh, really cool. And this is mainly because they were a trading empire that kind of flourished in Western Africa from the 13th to the 16th century. And uh, the Mali inhabitants kind of acted as the middlemen for like the gold trade during a lot of the late periods uh, of ancient Ghana. And they were essentially the brokers of ancient Africa, which, you know, they're in control of the money. So uh, they absorbed huge trading nations like Timbuktu, which, yes, actually was a place, and Gao, and um, they ruled a ton of uh, Southern Sahara with ambassadors in Morocco, basically all over that part of the world. And uh, sadly, though, they eventually outgrew their own strength and kind of collapsed into obscurity, right? Am I correct with that um, assessment towards the end there? Yeah, eventually, I feel like a large part of their their downfall was the greater technological advance of other empires, uh, specifically because while they were in West Africa, yeah. for the majority of their existence, they were a Muslim empire. And there was just much more influence from the Muslim empires yeah. in the other part of the world, too. So you had a, a combination of a lot of other things leading to their ultimate downfall. Um, but a key note, too, uh, of their time in existence, and you mentioned how, how rich they were, one of the richest empires ever to exist. At the time, yeah, it, within the, the actual, uh, the main domain of Mali, which was formed from the Manding Duchy initially, um, there was three gold mines like three sizable gold mines in that area. Yeah. So a lot of the the gold that was entering into the area, because you got to remember, by the time they were founded in 1235 CE, or officially became an empire in 1235 CE, um, yeah. the other, like the, the regions in Europe and that, and in Cyprus and, and in, you know, the, the Middle East and that, had been using their gold resources for so long and been digging it up and been using it and all that for all that time. Yeah. It was still fresh and rich enough, um, at least the mines that they had in Mali, where they became such a high producer of gold that in 1324, when Mansa Musa, who is largely believed to be the richest person of all time, um, did his made his pilgrimage to Mecca, um, when he traveled through Egypt, there are like... Um, What's the word I'm looking for? There are uh, th- there's 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 written records of, of people who commented on the time saying that they had they didn't even think it was possible for someone to be as rich as this person was or to have as much gold as yeah. this person had. And also there's reference that that two year pilgrimage left such an economic impact on Egypt that it devalued the cost of gold for years <laughs> because of just how much he brought in because he was just giving out gifts left and right when he came in. Now, I, uh, because of this, I knew this story. You uh, actually told me this anecdote last time we recorded. And um, I think a ruler flexing on the entire time period for the time definitely qualifies them for a high rank, just that alone. Um, they did have a pretty long existence of 375 years, uh, which is why my rank, I actually put them in a low A rank, high B. So I think I put them in an A tier personally, just because of the fact that they were basically the gold barons of the time, you know? And I kind of, you know, you you hit them in the purse, right? And I kind of wanted to give them a little bit higher of a ranking just because of the economic power that they had. And yeah, they kind of faded into obscurity and collapsed in on themselves, um, but that doesn't diminish the spectacle that was their existence. So I thought the rank A was a good place for these people. 
they, they had a very short peak, uh, but a long existence overall, uh, a long decline yeah. uh, at the end of it. Um, mm-hmm. But at the end of the day, their economic system mm-hmm. was way ahead of its time. The way that they taxed trade and the way that they dealt with trade coming through their their empire um, was yeah. it, it was impressive. It was it was way ahead of, of what other uh, what other uh, nations were at at the time. Um, they even they strived to give everyone in the empire a place. You know, there was laws protecting slaves. Um, but in terms of the management of the empire itself, it was largely decentralized. Uh, the Mansa or the, the yeah. emperor at the time um, only dealt with state matters. Local stuff was largely managed locally. That's a trend with a lot of these. I was surprised by that, actually. A lot of these uh, dynasties kind of had auxiliary rulers. I was very surprised. Like a lot of the times when you think of these empires, you uh, see like one iron fisted ruler. It's, it's what you imagine. Um, and I was actually really uh, fascinated, especially in a lot of these like uh, Islamic dynasties too, um, that it was kind of the rulership responsibility was kind of spread to almost the equivalency of like mayors and governors, right? Yeah. I mean, it's you got to imagine it's it's difficult for one person to manage you know, an empire, right? You need, you need to delegate, you need help yeah. to, to be able to successfully manage it. And we can see as we go further on this list and that the empires that were really short largely didn't do that. The shortest ruling empires were the ones where they tried to give one person ultimate power. But the issue with that is yeah. once that person dies and is gone, the whole empire just collapses, right? Because they didn't yeah. lay the groundwork or the system for its continuation, right? I think that is uh, that's what makes you a strong contender for a low rank too. What did you what would you ultimately rank uh, the Mali Empire, Jeff? For me, we're actually pretty close. We're closer than I thought we'd be on this one. I give them a B. Um Yeah. And my, my reason for the B is largely because of that economic impact that they had, the the trade that they established, um, and also the fact that the, the the laws that they introduced at the time were well ahead of the time for the area. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so I, I gave them a B. Um, and you you said A, focusing on B, set, settle with a B, give it a B plus. Yeah, well, you know what? I'm happy with a B as a ranking. I think that that's good. I'm already noticing that you have done a much wider and deeper dive when it comes to the <laughs> individual prep on these things. There's, Cause first, you're, I feel like you're putting me on a pedestal there. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like you're putting me on a pedestal there that I'm da- I'm bound to break here because there are certain empires on this list that I knew a lot about coming into it, and Mali was one of those. Whereas there's ones that I had to do more research into, and I feel like when we get to those now, people are going to be expecting me to. <laughs> yeah, you're going to have to carry the show. It's all right. I'm just the guy who pronounces places, names, and people wrong, and you're the guy who corrects <laughs> me and has the actual facts to back everything up. <laughs> Dude, there's a reason why I didn't say any leaders' names here, because there's a gentleman, the inhabitants of Kangaba acted as middlemen in the gold trade. It's like, I don't even think I said Kangaba right. <laughs> uh, it's I knew Ghana. Ghana. Ghana's um, familiar to me. <laughs> All right. Let's see what Empire number two is. All right. Empire number two, randomize. It is the Song Dynasty. It is, that is a Chinese dynasty. Um... They, I they they were big from 960 to 1279, I believe, uh, about 319 years or so. Uh, obviously, a large area. Yeah, just just around three uh, three million square kilometers. Population of uh, at the time uh, about 33 percent of the world's population. Yeah, um, which doubled over the course of their reign. So one of the the biggest impacts they had there is that at the beginning of their reign, this is where we really see uh, a massive boom in the Eastern Asian population. This I found fascinating because as we kind of talked at the beginning of this, that when it came to some of the Asian dynasties, it was challenging, right? Because a lot of this land was shared. But uh, these guys were kind of in an interesting position because they kind of picked up the pieces of the last failed dynasty. And when they came into 
play. They doubled their own population, like you said. Um, they were kind of the first Chinese dynasty that united the entire country until 1127, and uh, and then the southern portion until 1279. So um, during the Song, commerce flourished, paper currency came into uh, like more increased use. And uh, several cities, like we mentioned, boasted populations exceeding one million people, which is really wild to think about those kinds of numbers for that time. I mean, it's I don't know about you, Jeff, but I know for me, when we're talking about populations in the millions, we're th- I'm often thinking like past industrialization, right? Like, how can you sustain that number of people? But you also need to remember how big this part of the world, right, uh, was. And uh, widespread printing uh, brought increased literacy, and uh, with increased literacy, it kind of makes it easier to communicate and control a large uh, number of people. Um, But it kind of also closed the gap for, like, the broader elite and, you know, the regular person. And it also led to the opening of private academies. So this was kind of like an enlightenment period, um, the Song Dynasty. And I thought it was kind of interesting that they were also another group that was ultimately defeated by the Mongols. A lot of the the places on this list had some um, interaction with the Mongols, and I'm excited to actually get to the Mongol Empire. Yeah, so uh, for me, with ranking this this empire, the, they have a lot of high points. Yeah, and then they have a lot of really low points, mm-hmm. right? So they have a really low ceiling and a really, or sorry, a really high ceiling and a really low floor at the same time. Yeah. So while they had massive impacts on technology, engineering, and mathematics, it was a massively prosperous time for those trades. They led to innovations in navigation, in weaponry, yeah. and even in the arts. Um, they also dealt with constant invasions, yeah. uh, civilian uprisings, mm-hmm. p- very much full of political unrest. Their their military strength was weaker than the, the Jin, which ruled sort of alongside them for a little bit when, when they were kind of forced down into the south, which ultimately led to their downfall. Mm-hmm. Um, it was it was a time of unprecedented economic growth, uh, both economic and population growth. When we talk those two things, this is probably one of, if not the number one empire in terms of the growth over the time yeah. that it existed. But at the same time, they were just, they had such a poor militaristic strategy. They formed poor political alliances. And a lot of the success that they did have sort of piggybacked off of the former success of the Tang Dynasty. Yeah. So which came a couple before them, but like, so it's hard to give them like a super, super high ranking. For me, they're B tier. Yeah, I I said the exact same thing. And one of the reasons why I said B tier was uh, because there was a very clear through line of decline. Uh, They started off this dynasty with a really strong militaristic style of like this kind of warrior spirit. And, um, they just kind of slow it's almost like they got they domesticated themselves in a sense where they you know had this big renaissance shifted focus away from the more militaristic aspects of their culture which ultimately allowed them to fail to their neighbors who did not uh, follow the same path when it came to enlightenment yeah there was some huge renaissances going on in the surrounding areas as well like not to say that it was just the song dynasty that was you know creating new things and experimenting but uh they definitely leaned more heavily into the arts towards the end which kind of made them easy pickings for the mongols after their group had already kind of had this fall from grace but i think that's a good rank rank b it's uh, interesting that we both agreed on that one there we go we got uh we got one agreement out of the two so far uh, and the other one was pretty close so yeah. i'm i think we're yeah, i think, I think we're doing we good saw here. we saw to each other's reason uh all right all right what's the next one on the list jeff what do we got we got the inca oh i'm excited for this one the inca so we got our our lone our lone american continent representative on this list um the reason for that being it it's very hard to define a lot of the um the civilizations that existed in the americas uh as empires a lot of them were while they were impressive and they built very yeah. impressive cities and very impressive uh, architecture for some of them and that they were largely independent 
and very rarely did one group conquer a large area or control a large area. Yeah. Um, but the Inca, however, did. Uh, they controlled about two million kilometers uh, squared, uh, which is is substantial, you know, uh, a significant uh, <laughs> yeah. chunk of land. Um, at about a ten million population at their peak, they were from a shortly shortly reigning empire. But that's you know, we all know the contributing factors that led to why. Um, yes, the conquistadors. But, I said that like I was rooting for them. Like, eh, the <laughs> conquist- no, I'm not <laughs> I'm not rooting for the conquistadors in this situation here. <laughs> uh, lasted for, for about 95 years as an empire. Uh, obviously, they can trace their, their roots back further than that. But we kind of took some of these from... We had to pick a date to start them from, right, for some of them. So for the Inca, 1438 through to 1533, so about 95 years. Uh, population was around 10 million at the time, which is about 2% of the world population. But when you consider that that was in the Americas, yeah, uh, it, it puts a little bit more uh, of an emphasis on that. And factoring in the fact that of that 10 million population that they sort of asserted or ruled over, and again, this leans into the fact that I was talking about hard to define an empire— only about 40,000 of that were actual Inca. Yeah. But that being said, um, in, ancestral-wise, modern day, I believe I was reading uh, that their ancestry actually still accounts for 30% of the population that lives in those parts of the world in the modern era. So just to kind of paint you an idea of how far their reign was, I mean, they basically extended along the Pacific coast uh, from the Andes Mountains uh, from what is now northern Ecuador to central Chile, which is it's a pretty big swath of land and uh, by the early 16th century i know we said that their empire was around 10 million people but uh, the inca apparently controlled an empire of something like 12 million subjects and uh, they constructed vast networks of roads their architecture was highly developed and amazing Uh, it's iconic still today and uh, the remains of their irrigation systems uh, still our, we built a lot of our own modern cities on top of the skeletons of their old cities and their palaces, temples, fortifications are still evidence throughout the Andes. Like you can still find some of these ancient ruins and relics, which is really fascinating to me because uh, the Incan society was really like advanced in a lot of ways that European society wasn't. Uh, they are definitely on par with a lot of the empires of the old world. Uh, they had highly stratified um like kind of society with lots of layers and levels to it. Uh, they featured a bureaucracy and ultimately they probably could have gone on to become one of the hardest hitters in the modern world if it hadn't been the Spanish showing up and kind of destroying everything that they had built. As humans do. Um <laughs> Yeah, like uh, the most impressive thing for me about the Inca is the architectural achievements. Um, the fact yeah. that they were able to build these buildings that in an area of the world that I, I'm sure most people are aware very frequently has earthquakes, right? So yeah. they were able to build up these structures along a coastline <laughs> that was, you know, that was exposed to earthquakes that have lasted for this long. And when you think about what was happening in Europe at the time, that we have so many stories about European history of just the, the buildings collapsing because of one natural disaster and stuff like that. <laughs> these these things are still standing and have been around for, for so long. Like, it's the architecture is so impressive to me. That and the roadways that they were able to build. Um, yeah. It's the, the infrastructure and the architecture of the era is just it's their biggest thing that to me that impacts, you know, our society today, at least, especially when you talk about like arts and culture, right? Um, because the, not only were these buildings incredibly strong, at the same time, they also had a very unique style to them, right? That was yeah. so much, so very different from anything that was happening in, in Europe and other parts of the world at the time. And they were able to develop such a massive empire without the use of many things that had benefited Europe, like the yeah. European empires in their in their climb, such as native draft animals. You yeah. Know? They, they weren't here until they were brought over from Europe, you know, access to iron and steel, you know, very, it's much more difficult in the Americas. It's just a geographic thing. Right. Um, and even and, and the fact that they didn't have a, a, a defined 
centralized writing system and were mm-hmm. still able to grow to this size. Not even a centralized currency. They functioned off of a system of labor trade. So the fact that they were able to do all of that while and and contributing to that, we all know about their massive contribu- uh, contributions to math. Yeah. So on top of all that, astrology. The fact that they were able to do all of that stuff while really having less to start with is is just it's incredibly impressive to me for for me i i'll just i'll come up with it i gave them a tier yeah see i i wanted to give them a higher tier i said b tier and the reason that i said b tier is because even though they were in a vacuum they were unstoppable giants as soon as the rest of the world opened up to them it was like they were completely unprepared and ready to manage uh, an outside threat. It's like, it's, I feel like they could have achieved rank A. And I mean, it's not really their fault for not being aware of the evil that lies on the other side of the ocean. Um, but I feel like, would they have ever reached that peak if uh, colonialism had happened a hundred years earlier? You know what I mean? Yeah, but I think that there's more that that weighs into that factor than just their mm-hmm. competence as an empire. Like the fact that the the cultures were so different too, right? Like yeah, comparatively that's to hard. Europe, the Inca were such a, a much more peaceful people, right? Yeah, and and they, I feel like that on top of the fact that Europe had so many geographical advantages, you know, just like. The ability to, to, to have easy access to iron and steel, um, easy access to, to draft animals and stuff, allowed them to expand so much quicker and do so mm-hmm. much more that, I don't know, I think it's more impressive to me what the Inca were able to do at the time than what some of the other European empires were able to do yeah. based on what they started with, right? No, you're because right. Because they didn't have that foundation of being like, we have you know, readily available iron and steel to build strong weapons with or, or uh, you know, access to, to horses and that to transport goods a long distance and, and have these long trade routes, mm-hmm. you know. On top of that, so much of their territory was just covered in jungle, right? So it's like that also adds in, you know, you can't really build up massive cities and massive empires when you're surrounded by jungle. I right? feel like another valid point to make too here on this one is uh, for a lot of European history, we had killed all of the animals that killed us at that point. You know what I mean? It's not like it's not like during the 14th century, people were still getting eaten by lions in Europe. You know what I mean? So, you know, maybe I have judged them too harshly. You know, they're basically surviving in death lands um, and thriving for that matter. So, you know what? I will concede to that. I think the rank A is a, a good judgment as well. I didn't really think about the impending doom of jaguars around every corner. We're going to go. We're going to go with an A minus. <laughs> How's that? <laughs> we'll no, there. I think it's fair. Right. The Inca are, are, are very unique. Uh, especially on this list, they're unique, uh, but also unique in their part of the world. I will argue that that comment about um, being strapped for resources might be a bit defunct because they, because of how big uh, their range was. I mean, the amount of climates that you have from the Andes Mountains, from Ecuador, all the way to central Chile is um, pretty intense. I'm surprised that there wasn't more metallurgy going on there, but... When you figured out stone, you figured out stone, you know? The thing about it, though, is in order to be able to uh, make iron, you need to have easy access to to, to iron, right? Uh, same with steel, yeah. right? And they didn't really have the access to that that they did in Europe and, you know, in some of the places in Europe. And same with you when you talk yeah. about bronze, even getting into, like, crafting of bronze. Copper and tin readily available in places like Cyprus and, and, and you know, other places in the yeah. ancient world, less so in the Americas. So it, it's less of a, they didn't develop this, and it's more of a, they didn't have access to the specific type of resource to develop it. That's not to say that they didn't have access to other things that Europe didn't. Yeah. Right? And then again, when you talk about the terrain too, it's key to, like, it's key to keep in mind that even jungle or mountain, which is what it's mostly is there, right? are yeah. both difficult types of terrain for humans to really Absolutely. thrive in, right? Whereas Europe, you have a lot of plains, you know, a lot of flatland, a lot of farmlands. Mm-hmm. Africa, obviously, 
and we see exactly the, the same type of thing, right? We got lots of jungle, lots of desert, that kind of stuff, and it makes it more restricting on how an empire can grow, right? Whereas the the easiest places were Asia, the Middle East, and Europe, and those are the places where we see the the empires expand the biggest and thrive more, right? In terms of their geographical footprint, right? Yeah. Um. So I think that you know that that has to be taken into account a bit too. Um. Yeah. I I just yeah. For for me, yeah. It's just it's just what they started with based on yeah how they what they were able to create from that. yeah. No, I get that. It's like if we're looking at this, if we're looking, you know, through if we're using the tier list example, like if we're looking at like a skill tree kind of deal, right? It's like yeah. they were able to achieve similar levels of technology by teching up into different skill trees. So it doesn't make them yeah. any less valid. It's just that they just took different crafting materials and did something else with it that served their community and society just as equally if not better than some of the european or uh you know western uh histories and cultures as well so i i concede i i uh, accept them as rank a that's a good judgment all right so for the next one was this is this fifth now i think this is fourth fourth uh, uh yeah i think so no it's fifth it's uh, it's fourth it's fourth yeah i just crossed off the one fourth. we made beforehand yeah <laughs> All right, so fourth, random. Let's see. Oh, okay. So this one, uh, before I say it, this one is interesting because it's one of the ones I know the most about, but also one of the ones that because of that I'm the most critical of. Oh, interesting. Um, It's the Holy Roman Empire. Ah, Charlemagne. uh, Mm. (laughs) Hmm. Which uh, (laughs) ruled for a long time. One of the longest ruling empires on our list, 1,006 years, although... The word rule, I think, should be put in in air quotes. Uh, (laughs) Population hit about 29 million at its peak. It's about 3% of the world at the time. Uh, One of the smaller land extent empires on our list, only about uh, uh, 1 million square kilometers. Um, But it did go from the year 800 right through to 1806. Um, Obviously had a massive impact on today's society, Mm -hmm. on religion. I'm I'm interested to see what you have to say about it before I before I go off on a tangent. Well, firstly, we'd be uh, I think remiss if we didn't give a shout out to our last podcast where we talked about Charles Martel, uh, who might have uh, arguably allowed the Holy Roman Empire to exist through his uh, mighty loins and bloodline. So, uh, <laughs> give a, a shout out. <laughs> Yeah, the groundwork, you know. Um, So I I gave it a pretty high rank, and this is mainly just because of um, the mythos that surrounds the iconic Charlemagne, right? He was the first holy emperor in Europe since uh, the fall of Rome, right? Um, Comprised of Germany, Austria, Bohemia, uh, Moravia, Switzerland, the Netherlands, northern Italy, uh, they basically had their fingers in everything, even like France, Poland, Hungary, Denmark, um, It's pretty wild, and even though they didn't take up a huge amount of space in terms of their own empire, uh, they definitely were heavily involved in the rest of Europe at that point, right? Um, uh, It's kind of an interesting empire as well, because another big name graces the scene. Uh, You have Napoleon in the—or Napoleon, like Napoleon Dynamite. Like, (laughs) you know, Bonaparte, he comes in there— uh, and uh, after basically infighting uh, had weakened the once powerful state, uh, it allowed Napoleon to kind of come in and uh, put the final nail in the coffin. Um, I think I gave them an A rank. Now, my research what isn't as deep as yours, obviously, and you have much more insight into the Holy Roman Empire, but I think from... Between their population, uh, their thousand-year reign, and this kind of explosion of politics that kind of rewrote the way kind of democracy existed in the modern era, I think that they're deserving of that A rank, personally. All right, so I'm going to start mine off with saying the most quoted quote about the Holy Roman Empire— uh, All right. So everyone's probably going to take a deep sigh right now. Anyone who knows about us is going to be like, oh, he's going to do this, really. It's the Voltaire quote, which is, the Holy Roman Empire was neither holy, nor Roman, nor an empire. <laughs> uh, the Holy Roman Empire, it started off 
I mean, yes, Charlemagne was a was just an impressive ruler, and the problem is, the Carolingians weren't able to hold on for much longer after Charlemagne, and the infighting grew, and the empire immediately collapsed right after him until it was reformed by Otto the Great. Um, so it, there, there's a little bit of a split on whether you think the empire started in the year 800 or it started with Otto the Great uh, over 100 years later. Um, Charlemagne himself, while a lot of us reference him as the first Holy Roman Empire or Emperor, he never actually took the title of Holy yeah. Roman Emperor. Um, Otto the Great did and was the first to actually use the title. So there, there's, there is some contention on where it started. I put the year 800 because whenever possible, I defaulted to the earliest year. Yeah. Um, that being the case, um, the thing about the Holy Roman Empire is that up until the Luxembourg dynasty, yes, it was moderately significant. It was moderately important. It... it it had a big influence on the world. Although you could still say the whole holy part, mm -hmm. not really there. There was always almost constant infighting between the Pope and the emperor. Uh, they rarely ever agreed on anything. Um, it was a constant power struggle between the two of them to see who was yeah. the, the more important one. Uh, and a lot of bickering between them, a lot of childish behavior that led to the empire being stagnated in a lot of ways. Because when you title yourself the Holy Roman Empire, and then the Pope is not with you, you lose a, a lot of your, you know, uh, your sway. Um, the Roman part, obviously, it, it was never Roman. It, it's, it, it was just another example of someone trying to capitalize off of, off of the Roman title to, to form as their, as saying that they're their successor, when in reality... They weren't in any way. They were German. It was a German empire. Yeah. <laughs> well, even from our but, last podcast, we kind of uh, dove into that a little bit, right? In terms of mm -hmm. his, it's almost like he f copied the sins of the father to a certain degree, right? Where it's like, um, I think we ended our podcast by saying that Charlemagne learned the lessons of Charles Martel. and But ultimately, you know, a lot of the same infighting ended up happening, the same bickering with the Catholic Church. It's like, it's... It's kind of a great example of how history repeats itself, but within like three generations. Yeah, and I mean, if if we were being super tight and and strict about things like this, I feel like the Carolingian Empire and the Holy Roman Empire would be sort of separated from each other. Um, yeah. But in reality, a lot of times they are thought of and considered as the same. They did rule the same territory. Yes, there was a gap in between, but. Um, but it's after the Luxembourg dynasty where things just started to the the empire itself uh, to give a little bit of a frame of reference the empire itself or the rulers that made up the empire at the time the people who uh, a system was put into vote for the Holy Roman Emperor it was an elective monarchy right yeah now oftentimes that ended up being you would just vote for the the son of the the current emperor or there was so much bribery and under the table stuff going on that it would usually end up being someone from the same dynasty right yeah but when they hit the luxembourgs the other uh rulers within the empire they didn't want someone to have as much power as uh, Otto the Great and his uh, heirs did anymore right so rather than give the power to a king or to someone of that caliber they decided they were going to vote for a count mm -hmm. to be the next emperor and they voted for the count of luxembourg and that led to eventually the habsburgs taking over and i think from the moment the habsburgs took over the holy roman empire it began the end of the empire uh it was an empire that yes lasted for about 106 years but about 700 of those or well okay about like 600 of those were constant decline um, and constant infighting and constant bickering and political unrest and constant uh, combat over who should be in charge. And it, it just it just was not a well-managed system. It was not a well-managed empire. There was so much um, autonomy given to so many of the other, um, quote-unquote, uh, nations within the empire, uh, the Bohemians, the Czechs, um, you know, the Austrians. Um, you know, everyone... While they were part of this empire, they were also 
really left to their own desires and yeah for in a lot of cases were their own sort of autonomous uh vessel um the Habsburgs did a great job of keeping together something that was failing from the second that they yeah. took over um don't get me wrong i'm not trying to completely rag on the, the, the like there's like there's some massive Habsburg fan base out there that's going to rip me apart <laughs> um they like don't get me wrong they they did good to hold an empire together for that long they constantly introduced reforms that allowed it to maintain some form of relevance and some form of power and you have to yes you do have to give them credit for the fact that they were able to keep this thing in existence for so long um it is impressive to that extent but i feel like that's one of the very few impressive things I'm, about the empire i'm sensing a low b rank from you uh Remember what I said? It's one of the ones that I'm the most critical of? Yeah. I gave the Holy Roman Empire a D tier. Oh, snap! <laughs> a D tier! I just think if you take all of the of the Holy Roman Empires and put them on their own tier list and rank them off, 90% of those are going to be in the F tier. They just are. <laughs> they just... It, I, like, they, they had moments, moments throughout their history where they had these booms where it looked like things were going to turn around and they had a, something great behind them, you know? Uh, uh, Maria Theresa, uh, Charles V, um, Otto the Great, you know, these moments were these bursts of, of greatness that ultimately got extinguished very quickly. Um, and, and to the point where throughout its entire existence, it almost remained stagnant. You know, yeah. it didn't, it didn't really improve. It didn't really grow. A lot of the empires, that w- other empires that we're looking at on this list, they, they improved so much over their time. And a lot of the ones that I give the high rankings to are because of that that improvement. Now, I might be a little a little strict on it by yes, they had a cultural impact on our politics and on our legal system. Um, especially with the elective monarchy system and the system that they put in of giving specific regions uh, the vote to a certain extent. So but also I also feel like it's you have to come to a point too where you separate what the Holy Roman Empire did with what the Austrian Empire did. Yeah. Right? I could I, I could I could give up go I, I could go to like a C. Uh, I was gonna a, suggest a in the middle. I could tell I can feel your passion for this subject, <laughs> um, which is why you gave it such a hard uh, D rating. But um you know Let's say that uh, you turned me a little bit. I bring it down to a B. We'll meet in the middle at a C on that one. I think that um, I'd be a fool to try and argue with you on this one, as it would be a losing <laughs> battle. Um, so <laughs> I will I will once again concede to your wisdom on this one, Jeff. <laughs> Randomize. I will win one of these. Also, <laughs> I think we're, we're on five to- now. We are going six. to the okay. Uh, all right, this one is one that uh, that I'm interested to hear your point on Ooh. because uh, you said you were interested in it coming up. It's the Mongolian Empire, or also known also known as the Yuan Dynasty in uh, in China. Yes, the Mongolian Empire. Um, well, first off, Genghis Khan. I mean, one of the most <laughs> iconic historic figures of all time i don't think there's a piece of historical media like you know if we're talking about like hollywood you know night night at the museum all those kind of kitschy like history movies always has a genghis khan character i mean in terms of prevalence in modern pop culture definitely has the staying power right um they're their empire, not so much in terms of staying power. I think they only lasted around 160 years, um, but they were the largest non-colonial empire. Uh, like I said, Genghis Khan, you don't need to say much more than that. Um, basically, if a nation existed during the time of the Mongol Empire, uh, they likely had a few encounters with them. Uh, they were on a heavenly mission to rule the world, and uh, they honestly got kind of close. (laughs) Um, They were a nomadic people. They had one of the largest and most skilled armies of the day with their cavalry being renowned even in the modern era. I mean, 
Their horseback archers are still notorious in war games today. Uh, they used technology. This is actually, to me, a really cool fact. Uh, they used technology from conquered regions to modernize their military, which allowed them to take down like walled cities, something that th was thought to basically be impenetrable by nomadic people. Um, they were propaganda masters uh, uh, with this really cool tidbit that if a city surrendered, uh, they were basically spared. Otherwise, they were slaughtered en masse and turned into slaves so it's like Genghis Khan though they didn't like even though the Mongolian Empire didn't necessarily have like a settled I don't know they didn't have a Rome per se you know that they didn't have a big walled city they uh more than made up for it by just being roving death squads that basically nobody would want to screw with and I gave them a really high ranking and I felt as though the Mongolian Empire uh, earned and deserved the rank of S believe it or not um just because in terms of their political uh like influence on the world i mean they influenced a lot of the policies of other cultures and empires at the time um but they didn't really have any themselves that was largely i don't know adopted uh they definitely had some uh, tactics militarily that were adopted and uh, used by uh, some of their victims in the future when it came to rebounding and getting back on the world stage. But when it came to armies ruling vast swaths of land and a massive gene pool that basically isn't like Genghis Khan rumored to like hold like percentage points in terms of human genetics. Like, is didn't he not have a measurable effect on the human genome? <laughs> like, like Genghis Khan was unstoppable. I don't know how much of that we could, like, how much is conjecture and how much is fact. Uh, I'd imagine something like that would be hard to fully verify because, like, yeah. what do you take genetics from everyone and see if the DNA is... But the, when we like, were talking I, yeah. about... When we were talking about raid-based economies in the last podcast, the Mongolian Empire is the raid-based economy. Like, they had it figured out. You know, uh, here's the thing for me. Uh, first off, 24 million square kilometers <laughs> yeah that is that is just impressively large um now the thing for me on it is short-lived high peak short-lived yeah. during the reign of genghis khan yes it was undoubtedly s tier um, yeah the problem is everyone that came after genghis khan. yeah yeah um it didn't really hold strong. He had a couple good airs, and then after that, it just kind of devolved. But when I say that, that's not to say that it just completely evaporated or dissipated. After, you know, 1368, it still left impacts on everything, you know, on, on Chinese society, on, you know, obviously, the, you know, the upper, the northern portions that would eventually become modern-day Mongolia, yeah. where to this day... Horse culture is still huge, yeah. um, and nomadic culture and 30, as well. And over and over thirty percent of their population in modern day Mongolia is nomadic. Yeah. the steppe um, people. And fifty percent of it lives in the capital city, so that's eighty yeah. percent right there. Um, so you, there are you can see the measurable impacts that they did have, and also measurable measurable impacts on sciences and on math. Um, because and a lot of that derives from the militaristic genes mm -hmm. that they used. People don't realize how much in the past um, sciences were fully just oriented towards militaristic benefits yeah. sometimes, and were able to then be branched out into other things. On top of that, math math is, was a huge thing for for war at yeah. the time, right? Um, and and yeah, and the, there's just the fact that they were able to unite all of these tribes and clans that were independent for so long and, and, and to the point where they have influenced so many modern day borders yeah. um just based on on their on the tribes that they were able to unite and help sort of go from a tribal government to almost a clan form of government right um they were large they were short-lived but they had a massive impact on history we can see that in literature today you can't read something about the ancient world or, or about 
you know, the past that doesn't mention, you know, the Mongolian yeah. Empire or Genghis Khan in some way. Um, so, yeah, the impact was significant. I, I put it at an A tier. Um, the reason I did was because of that length uh, and because of the fact that they had one really, really great emperor uh, or ruler. Um, and then after that, it was it, it entered into the sort of the same thing that the Holy Roman Empire did in that it was a constant decline after Genghis Khan. Yeah. Um, not not really, the, not to the extent of the Holy Roman Empire. Don't get me wrong, because the extent of the Mongolian Empire grew after Genghis Khan. The The largest extent of the empire was not under Genghis Khan. I believe it was under Kabul Khan, but I, yeah. I could be wrong on that. Don't quote me. You actually that. are. Uh, um, I believe you are correct on that one. Um. So, you know, it, uh, it's not like it was instant decline or whatever, right? The, there were There was a couple... You know, good rulers that followed him up, but after Kabul Khan, things deteriorated quickly. Yeah. Um, so that's why for me, I gave them an A tier. I would not, I I would not be too upset with throwing them as now. S-tier. Let me make an argument here for why I think that they're S tier. Because first off, they're one of the iconic nomadics, right? So they, what I feel like gave them a lot more weight in this debate is that. You know, they're competing with people who had defined roles in their civilizations, in their cities. You had people of antiquity. You had people who spent their entire lives studying mathematics in universities. And rather than just give up on this, uh, one of the reasons why I thought they deserved that S-tier credit is because even though they lacked that ability intuitively in the structure of being a nomadic people, when they went from place to place... They knew well enough not to kill the intellectuals. They would give them an opportunity to enlist, which gave them... It's like, I don't know if this is true. It's like the joke about um, the Great Wall of China being put up to defend against nomadic people and then the ladder being invented a year later. I don't think that's true. But it's this whole kind of idea that it was like every time that they hit a new challenge they were like all right we need to abduct somebody who can solve this problem for us <laughs> and eventually they just kind of refined this into a process that was kind of progress you know it allowed them to kind of continue to do what they were doing yes they burned bright and didn't last that long but still 162 years of non-stop warring and conquering is pretty impressive for people who laid no land as, like claim as, as their own. You know what I mean? They didn't have a capital city per se. Yeah. So for me, uh, the reason I'm okay with with going with giving this an S tier is because the reason I put it in an A tier is because of the short length of the empire. But at the same time, while the empire itself didn't last particularly long, it spawned a bunch of other. Mm -hmm. nations and regions that continued afterwards right russia would not have been a thing if it wasn't for the mongolian empire yeah um for example modern day china was heavily influenced by the mongolian empire Mm -hmm. um you know uh, there's there is you know the the turks were heavily influenced by the mongolian empire so while they didn't last as a contiginous empire for super long Mm -hmm. they did leave branching branch off nations and that that do still have an impact on today's society and like i said we can see that in modern day borders right yeah um so i i would i would be okay with conceding an s tier for them all right i think does that make them our first official s tier then it it does it makes them our first official s tier and i i think another point to this too right is obviously you know when we're looking at emperors and rulers of the time right there's the big ones but like i think that genghis khan is if not the same amount of recognizable maybe even more recognizable than a name like julius caesar now that might be uh that might be that might be a hot take but i feel like genghis khan is one of those few leaders throughout history that everybody is aware of their existence. Yeah, I don't think you're far off uh, with saying that. Like, I I think, um, obviously, if you're going to talk about, like, the greatest sort of emperor's period of just singular, an emperor itself, I feel like he's top three, no matter who you're you're looking at, right? Like, Alexander's going to be number one in everyone's eyes, probably. Mm -hmm. Uh, But he falls well before our our, uh, set time period anyway. 
Um, and I feel like Augustus is probably most people's number two, and it's probably yeah. Genghis Khan after yeah. that. So, um, yeah, like I, 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 in no way con- contending how important Genghis Khan was or how great of an emperor Genghis Khan was. It's just I, I have to sort of take into account how much do we weigh an empire's peak yeah. versus its fall or or its best emperor versus its worst emperor. A charismatic right? leader makes a nation, though, right? And from what I read, uh, people loved Genghis Khan. He's still beloved to this day. It's kind of interesting it, how um, history has lauded it, him as a hero in parts of the world. It makes a nation, but it doesn't necessarily mm-hmm. maintain a nation. That's true. All um, right, so I guess we'll move on to the next one then, Jeff. Yes, we will. I am randomizing right now. Okay. So, quick back thing on this one is this is the only one that I actually didn't write down a tier to. Uh, and I'll, I'll explain why a, a little bit. But it, it's it's also very loosely an empire. Uh, I put it on here because I, because I wanted to give us more of a wider range of empires to throw in it is very very loosely an empire uh it is the uh the iberian union i thought you were gonna say that i had a bias to this one because uh i love a good story um my my background my mom's portuguese my father's a dutchman and uh, I think that uh, there's a hilarious through line that Portugal and the Dutch were at war for the majority of this story. <laughs> and I don't know. I kind of romanticized it a little bit, to be honest with you. <laughs> uh, so the thing for me is that, uh, yeah, it was it's the shortest empire on our list, first off, uh, 60 years. Yeah, 60 years. Um, about 29 million people, which was 6% of the world's population, and it did take up over 7 million square kilometers. So yeah. sizable. Um, all of the Iberian Peninsula. Um, but the, the the thing is, is that it's tough to separate it from the Holy Roman Emperor uh, Empire in some ways. Yeah. Um, because you have, you know, you, you have the Habsburg rulers in Austria and then you have the Habsburg rulers in Spain and... It's it uh, for a lot of people. It's hard to separate those two from each other. But in reality, I think the Iberia version was even worse managed somehow. Well, they treated the, the Roman Empire. Well, they treated the Portuguese terribly, which ultimately led to the Portuguese being like, "Hey, we're not taking this." And uh, it all kind of revolves around the Thirty Year War, right? And then the the fact that they were so short-lived is entirely their failure to design any form of a succession plan whatsoever. Yeah. Um, like, they were followed up. Like, it just... The War of Spanish Succession, which just destroyed Europe for years because they just were incompetent at coming up with a legitimate succession plan. And whether mm-hmm. you want to believe it or not, that is a legitimate part of ruling a kingdom or yeah. an empire is being able to ensure its existence after you're gone. Yeah. Um, and while the Habsburgs deteriorated, maybe not in a way that they thought or could plan for since it was <clears throat> incest, um, it, it just, I, cough, like cough. It, it, it just boggles incest. my mind <laughs> that they could mismanage things so badly that 60 years is all this thing took to completely yeah. dissolve. Now, in fairness, it this union was kind of sparked from the same problem, right? Because all of this union was kind of triggered after the leadership of Portugal had passed away, and they were looking at somebody. They were trying to figure out who was going to take uh, the mantle as ruler, right? And this was kind of when this, uh, it, this union was kind of formed, right, between the kingdoms of uh, Castile, uh, Aragon, and the kingdoms of Portugal. Uh, under the Castilian crown, right? And uh, this brought the entire Iberian Peninsula, as well as Portugal's overseas possessions, a.k.a. Brazil, uh, under the Spanish Habsburg kings, right? And um, they were the only element that kind of connected the multiple kingdoms and the territories that were, you know, ruled by these six separate government councils, right? Because they were kind of given their own freedom, right? Um, but the government institutions uh, and legal traditions of each kingdom, though they remained independent from one another, 
ultimately all went through these Habsburg kings, right? And like I said, this kind of led to this weird mistreatment of Portugal because they started getting more heavily taxed um, because during this 30-year war, they had a hard time siding against the English, who was one of Portugal's oldest allies at the time. Um, and they had to back Spain as they were kind of part of Spain at this time. And this resulted in taxes and levies being put on Portugal, and this eventually sowed the seeds for revolution. And uh, this, because the nobility of Portugal started falling out of favor, uh, and also, you know, the Portuguese were having their own conflict with the Dutch at this point. <laughs> but I mean, it it's kind of this classic tale, right? Where I don't want to say that they were. I don't know, marginalizing Portuguese people, because I don't think that that's what was going on. But it was one of those things where they were definitely punishing them for their role in the 30 year war. And maybe when you're already an unstable government entity, not a good idea to poison the well a little bit. And that kind of ultimately uh, led to their downfall. Now, logically, I would probably put these guys at a rank B. But like I said, I romanticized this part of the world a little bit. So I gave them uh, a rank A. But I um, I have no issues <laughs> demoting that ranking. I am still torn on how I Because it's just... <sighs> they could even be a C rank because of their mismanagement. Do we include uh, Habsburg Spain as a continuation for this ranking? Or do we say it just ended in 1640? Uh, I say we could end it in 1640 because I feel like they were a different entity at that point, right? Yeah. I, For me, I don't know. I just, I don't, I, I think um, for me... For me, if I could give them an incomplete ranking, <laughs> that's, what, <laughs> that's what I would give them. Because I, I just... I don't feel they're they're deserving of an A. Or how S much? Tier. Here's a good question, um, though. How much does them being, how much does them still being part of the Hasburg Kings? How much does that affect their ultimate ranking? For me, it gives me it gives me more. Um, for me, it would give me more to rank on, and I would give them like a C tier probably if I was including um, Habsburg Spain. If I'm not including Habsburg Spain and just going with the uh, Iberian Union itself, uh, which to be fair, is what we put in our in our thing. So, makes sense. Um, I feel like I, I, I have to give them like a C or a D just because it's not that they were they they were poorly managed or anything. It's that they just so completely failed to lay the groundwork for the empire to truly last. It was sloppy. Truly form. And the mismanagement around every corner. Don't get me wrong; it, it it's it was the start of a golden age for Spain in terms of arts and literature, and um, you know some of the the world's most famous you know writers and painters came out of that era, right? Um, they nurtured the arts very well. Um, the the they were, for all intents and purposes, a a well. They grew well. They had good growth. They had good technological mm -hmm. growth. They had good population growth. They just, I just don't know how much of that I can lend to the empire itself and how much of that I can lend to the fact that, that Iberia was just a more developed area in terms of those things, in terms of the arts, in terms of literature, in terms of architecture and that because of the lasting influence of the Muslim empires that had ruled it before that had left behind so much of that technological knowledge and that advancement and put them at this period where they could just consistently keep going. Right? Yeah. I don't know how much of the good of them we can really give to the Iberian Union. Or so it, Habsburg. if the Iberian Union is a McDonald's, there's only one employee on the floor. The ice cream machine is broken. Uh, you can still get a big <laughs> Mac. You can still get a Big Mac and, you know, all the other classics. But uh, you could tell that this uh, location's on its last legs. <laughs> so for me, yeah, I, I, I got to say C or D. All right. I, I would say C. All right. We'll, we'll go with C. We'll, <laughs> we'll go with C. Like I said... My if it was an option, I would say incomplete. Um, but I think C is the C is the tier list option for me. I don't think that we have a whole a whole lot of D tier things on this list. Maybe we should just drop it in a D tier so everything else isn't as lonely. <laughs> <laughs> I've got some D's coming up. I'll, I'll I'll give it a D tier. Sure, why not? All I'm okay right. with the D tier. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Let's let's treat them the way they treated Portugal. Let's just 
put them on the back burner. They go to <laughs> they get D tier. All right, what's next? Now here's one. Here's one that uh, that I think we'll probably have some debate on. Uh, okay, it is the Byzantine Empire. So the oh, the Byzantines. Um, the Byzantine. They're an interesting one because I did. They were one of the first groups that I started my prep on and they were just constantly being referenced and referenced even more as I was going through all these other empires so um, for some reason uh, the term Byzantine reminds me of Star Trek I'm not 100% sure why to be honest with you I'm I know there's an alien species or race that I'm thinking of like the empaths. I forget what they're called. It's completely irrelevant. I don't know why, but <laughs> it, um, I don't know. Um, I'll, I think I'll start with my ranking on this one and uh, kind of try to justify it. So I actually rank these guys as a B. Not that I didn't think that they were like a good empire. Um, I gave them the B rank mainly because they were kind of tough bastards for my assessment. I mean, they survived the fall of Rome while the western portions of Rome were overwhel- uh, overrun by the Ottoman Empire, right? Um, they were able to remain united somehow. Their capital was the iconic uh, Constantinople, right? Um, they joined in on the Crusades uh, for protection from the Vatican, and uh, they eventually fell to the Ottoman Empire. But, I mean, the Ottoman Empire isn't something to laugh at. They're kind of like the Mongols of uh, this time in terms of they just kind of had their fingers in everything. So it's kind of a tricky situation because they allied themselves with some pretty powerful people, but they didn't really do much with it. They did last a thousand years. They had an overall population of 26 million, which is huge. Um, But again, I kind of feel like they fall into the same trap as kind of the Holy Roman Empire in a way where... They were just kind of sustaining based on reputation alone, and that reputation wasn't enough to keep them afloat. I don't know. That's my take. <laughs> yeah, so just 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 a quick thing so that people don't tear us uh, apart in the comments. Uh, it was the Germanic tribes that overthrew Rome, the Visigoths, the uh, Vandals, uh, yeah. to a lesser extent the Franks. Uh, not the Ottomans. The Ottomans stuck out east. Yeah. Um, for the most part, and and south of of uh, of Rome, of course, but the Rome itself was yeah sucked by the Visigoths and Vandals. Um, yeah, this is probably the one that I know the most about. Um, if not, it, well, it, I'd say it's tied with the Roman Empire on, on that front. Um, the thing about the Byzantine Empire, it was more of a uh, middling empire than the than the Roman Empire was, in that the Roman Empire had tremendous peaks. And then yeah. drastic valleys, whereas the Byzantine Empire sort of kind of just chugged along for for quite a while. They had they had high peaks, but they weren't as high as Rome's. They had yeah. low ceilings, but they weren't anywhere near as low as Rome's. And they managed to keep things together for a long time through extending uh, ethnicities, um, extending you know levels of autonomy amongst the groups within their, their mm-hmm. rule. Um, and at the constant threat of the Ottomans for so long, and, and the successors to the Ottomans and the other um, Arabian and, and Islamic um, um, empires. So, you know, I, I they had, there, there's a lot of great parts, right? Like, there's no, no denying, you know, the Justinian era, um, you know, was, was tremendous. There's no denying, you know, Heraclius was was tremendous. There's there's these peaks that are impressive. Basil II, that kind of stuff that that's great. But then you have so many emperors that just kind of held the line. Yeah. Um and their doing so ultimately sort of led to being able to give up so much ground of their empire to the point that the later portions of the empire just began began deteriorating to the point that at the end the empire, quote unquote, was just Constantinople and a small part of like southern yeah. Greece, right? Like it, it's, um, it is truly the definition of an empire that is in constant decline. Yeah, um, its peak was when it started, um, and from there, yes, there was moments where emperors were able to get things back and sort of stagnate things and and hold them level for a little bit, but almost always that would be followed up by four or five guys that would just you know, uh, 
keep things as they were or not do enough or yeah or, or be irrelevant for the most part in in the grand scheme of things like uh like seven of the 11 constantines like it just <laughs> um yeah so I, it, for me in terms of cultural impact they were massive obviously um you don't stick around for a thousand and fifty eight years longer than any other empire yeah. on our list without having a massive cultural impact and an impact on society. Legal systems today owe so much to the Byzantine Empire. Most of the laws that we still use today were either created by the Romans and reformed by the Byzantines or were created by the Byzantines. Um, Justinian's set of laws are to this day the baseline for the legal system that most countries use. Um, artistically massive impact we see that so much through everything religiously huge impact i mean huge impact the the first true christian empire yeah that was like actually you know formed in christianity you know we had obviously constantine the great in in rome um stuff like like like, like there was moments right but the byzantine empire not only became the first true strong Christian Empire, but also uh, brought orthodoxy to the forefront, which is still the second largest branch of Christianity in existence today, right? Yeah. Um, it just... And, and of course, Constantinople. I mean, it's so much of how of the Byzantine Empire can be summarized by just... It's iconic. The impressiveness of Constantinople itself. Uh, it The fall of Constantinople is to in a lot of ways um the end of of such a massive era um the beginning of of the development of modern society and that in a lot of ways the impact that the con that the fall of constantinople had on the world uh you know it can't be understated and that's because the byzantines were able to hold it for so long and it was just a center of of everything of yeah. literacy of education of art of religion of everything for so long well they just kind of continued what the roman Emp or the eastern roman empire had been kind of doing all along right they just kind of doubled down on the things that they were already good at right they did um and introduced kind of their own flair to it and alterations yeah. to in that um like I said, for me, the biggest thing for them is the cultural impact that they left on society. Yeah. Um, I what, what what did you give them for the tier again? Uh, I believe that I gave them a B rank. I'm okay with going with B. I gave them a C. Um, yeah. I gave them a C. But honestly, I was on the fence between whether I wanted to give them a C or a B. I was, uh, I, I was very much... I think I went back and forth multiple times going between B and C on this. So I... I, um, I will I will contend B for this one uh, if you know. Um, I mean, you, uh, you described a lot of, in terms of what they offered towards modern, uh, the modern era, and what inspirations and all that kind of stuff. I think that you made a pretty good point to them being a uh, uh, on the B tier. I uh, will say uh, that I was talking about Star Trek at the beginning that I, the. The people that I'm thinking are the Betazoids. <laughs> I have no idea why that became the Byzantines in my mind. Um, but uh, that was kind of driving me crazy. So I did a double a double check. I was like, what am I thinking of? Why am I thinking Star Trek? But no, it's nowhere near what they're called. They're the Betazoids, not the Byzantines. <laughs> I don't know what I was thinking there. But no, I, I'm happy with B rank. And uh, we can uh, continue on down our list. It's funny because that you mentioned that it makes you think of Star Trek for no real reason. Because for me, for no real reason, for some reason, it triggers like, um, like Battlestar Galactica. <laughs> wow, that's <laughs> so my, weird. Just the word, just the word Byzantine. Like I, I don't know. It's I understand the word is Greek, but like it just. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> it sounds extraterrestrial. Like if an alien were to approach you and be like, I'm from the Byzantine Empire, you wouldn't bat an eye. You'd be like, hey, it sounds like an alien empire to me, you know? <laughs> All right. Next up, we have uh, ooh, the Hunnic Empire. Oh, the Hunnic Empire. I uh, am excited about this one in the same way. Uh, that uh, I was excited for the Mongols and that it's another nomadic tribe that 
left a pretty big mark in history. Uh, also another one that's largely known for one ruler. Yeah, and there is uh, there's one fact that I love about, uh, if we're talking about the ruler, we're talking about Attila, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Attila the Hun, the iconic Hunnic emperor, and um, I have a really cool fact about his death, which I would love to get to at the end of this. It's just, to me, it influenced my rank, just because I think they're just kind of badasses in general, but they are similar to the <laughs> Mongol Empire in that they were a nomadic group uh, known for kind of canvassing the countryside. They were a pain in the butt to everybody who kind of crossed paths with them um, through a combination of advanced weaponry, amazing mobility, uh, battlefield tactics. They achieved military superiority over many of the largest rivals basically subjugating the tribes that they conquered um they were both seen as primitive but also advanced by the romans who took uh, some pretty keen measures to try and stop them however uh they ultimately kind of had a hand in their collapse in terms of being one of the many distractions that led to the fall of rome uh, they were seen as savage like i said Yet uh, many of their battle tactics were implemented by other peoples at the time. So uh, the Huns are given credit to ushering in a new era of humanity that is a little bit more moral based, weirdly, um, and less sword based. Uh, Attila was actually said to have been turned back from the gates of Rome by the Pope himself, which was described as a triumph of uh, moral persuasion over the sword. Uh, unfortunately, though, like we've talked about a lot, um, the Hunnic Empire fell prey to to the same issues of uh, the Holy Roman Emperor, uh, Empire, the the Mongol Empire, and that basically as soon as Attila died uh, and they lost their charismatic leader, uh, they entered their decline uh, and ultimately um, didn't last very long after the death of Attila. Yeah, um, so it is our lowest in terms of population percentage of all of the... Uh, and only lasted 100 years. At 2%, yeah, only lasted 100 years. Um Short-lived, but very powerful at their peak, constantly mm -hmm. threatening the Roman Empire to the point where multiple Roman emperors had to just make deals with them to be like, listen, just yeah. stay back, <laughs> right? And we're talking both the East and the West. Like, they managed yeah. to contend both. Um, the unified tribal leadership, uh, they didn't really have a form of central government, um, yeah. or really government at all, to be honest. Um they were formidable in mounted archery, of course. Uh, their whole military is based off of that. Um, they had a huge impact on society, a significant contributing factor to the Great Migration, um, which can't be understated either. Um, it led to the, the greater ethnic diversity in Europe, the deterioration of Roman power, um, yeah. the formation of the numerous Roman successor states that came after the fall of the Roman Empire in Western Europe. And that a lot of that can be uh, in, in a way contested to uh, impart the Huns. But at the same time, like I said, their government relatively non-existent. It was more of a bunch of people coming together and being like... Um, We'll fight together. Yeah. But that's about all we do together. Right. Yeah. So for me, I think it comes down to how much you value militaristic um, superiority um, in terms of where you rank an empire. Because, yes, it's an important factor. But to me, it's a factor. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so for me, because of all the other aspects that just aren't there, uh, I gave it a D tier. <laughs> Interesting. I would have put them at B personally, but that's mainly because of this fact here. This is what I thought was really cool. So to this day, Attila's body has never been recovered, right? And this has to do with the really interesting way that they buried him after he passed away. So one of the last things that they did united, basically, was bury Attila. And they buried him by damming up a river. So they dammed up a river so that the river would flow around for a while. They dug a grave, a tomb, everything like that, buried him with all of his riches and wealth, and then they destroyed the dam. And then the river just rushed right over him. And the thinking was is that you can't rob the grave of somebody whose grave is under the water. But uh, to this day, we've only... Rec I think some artifacts have been recovered that have led people 
to think that they found the location around where he might have been buried. But in terms of his actual coffin, his body, all that stuff, it's lost to time. And it could have been sucked out by the river. It could still be buried there to this day. But I think that's a pretty epic burial. They parted a river buried him and then destroyed the dam so no one could get to it and i was like man what an epic way to go out as a ruler which is why i gave them maybe a little higher of a ranking <laughs> but um i i can accept c I, or b personally again, I, I i think the hanuk empire again is victim to the how much do you rank an empire versus an emperor right because like attila the hun yeah was you know a significant ruler and a significant figure in world history but in reality, when I say the Hunnic Empire to someone, that's They're all like, they huh? really think of. You mean right? the bad like, guys no, from Mulan? Attila, Attila the Hun. Yeah. Well, <laughs> <laughs> they just Attila the Hun is literally the only reference point for it, right? Yeah. And you can say the same thing for the Mongol Empire, but at the same time, the Mongol Empire's uh, impact is just more more so and more yeah. there. Whereas the Hunnic Empire, as significant as Attila the Hun was... That's just kind of it. It's right? kind of like uh, during World War II, they, there's this weird quote where it's like, uh, the Japanese are just like the rest of us, only more so. And it's kind of what the the Mongols were to the Hun, in that they were everything that the Hun were, only more so. And uh, because of that, they're remembered throughout history uh, as being a lot more impactful than the Hun. So I can accept them being a C rank. All right. I'll give them a C. All right. What is next? Randomize. We've got, ooh, the Tsardom of Russia. Interesting. This one um, I found fascinating because Russia's history during this time is, like, very tumultuous. It's kind of all over the place in terms of what they're doing, contributing to the global scale. How are they interacting with the world's cultures in terms of trade? I think this kind of wraps up with the story that everyone knows. Isn't Anastasia kind of based on the fall of the Tsardom? I mean, I feel like it's such a. I feel like I've I've seen like four or five different famous stories that are kind of based off of the Rasputin. The fall Rasputin. Of Russia. Well, that was that was the later that was the later Russian Empire. With yeah. Rasputin. I, I I agree with you in most of the fact where you said that they were uh, um, tumultuous or that it was a tumultuous time because it was very up and down. Uh, on one hand, it was a booming time for the region for russia but on the other hand if you compare that to the rest of the world at the time yeah they were still behind you know uh behind the eight ball compared to yeah there's some interesting other places were there's some interesting anecdotes where uh, the this part of russia in history was one of the first times that uh, a nation appealed to other nations restrictions on weapons and warfare because the Russian military realized how far behind they were technologically and was kind of petitioning the rest of the world to fight on equal terms. And uh, for a little bit, they actually it kind of worked. But then other nations were like, this is stupid. Why aren't we using guns? Let's shoot these people. You know, so it's uh, kind of an interesting period because it feels like a lot of early Russian history like they're just barely getting on their feet when someone sweeps the leg, you know, and then they're just barely getting on their feet when someone sweeps the leg. Right. And it's this weird time in like for at least their history where they never seem to be able to get a leg up on anybody. Yeah. I, they claim to be the third Rome uh, and successor to the Byzantines after the fall of Constantinople um, for what you want to uh, <laughs> want to take from that. Be it as you weigh. Um the only thing I, I think where they really had a leg up in true Russian fashion is landmass. Um, yeah. 12 million square kilometers they yeah. took up, yet still only made up about 3% of the world's population. So yeah. not kind of laying the foreground for what modern day, you know, Russia would become in, in that aspect. Um, conquering a lot of territory with with very little resistance because nobody really wants Siberia. Yeah, and they had this weird claim, too, where they said that they controlled this entire area, but there was the nomadic people that lived in Siberia, northern portions of modern-day Russia, and those people were technically part of the Tsardom of Russia, but not really at the same time. They were kind of largely ungoverned, um, but this uh, this uh, period in history does... Um, 
uh, kind of break the mold because uh, Russia had a regular army recruited by conscription uh, from the peasantry and petty town folk. And it was actually the first army of its kind in Europe. Um, so it kind of it, interesting. They, they kind of fulfill the same role now, actually, that they did back then and that I hate to, you know, kind of come off of stereotypes and stuff like that, but it's kind of like this grim, not bleak existence, but they're just kind of on the outskirts, not fully becoming the glorious nation that they could be, at least for a long time. I think it's important here to note that when we talk about the Tsardom of Russia, the Tsardom of Rus, um, we are not referring to the Russian Empire that came after it. Um, yeah. Which under Peter the Great and Catherine the Great had, and the Romanovs in general, had a much, um, much more prosperous period of growth. Um, the Tsardom itself was relatively isolated for the first century of, of its existence. Yeah. Um, it, it, it was an autocratic empire, um, which put a lot of strain on it. Um, throughout most of its existence. They had strong bureaucracy. They expanded very quickly and very consistently, but they faced very little resistance. So, again, we have a, another notion of an empire that was in decline for more than half of its existence. Yeah. So, for me, I have to acknowledge the area that they did take up. It is a significant chunk of area, and I have to acknowledge the fact that although it might not be the type of history we'd like that it influenced, it did influence autocracy, right? And, and forms of government and did leave an impact, whether it be good or bad, depending on your views on politics, it did leave an impact. Yeah. So for me, I gave them a C tier um, because they did leave a little bit of a cultural impact. But really, when you compare them to the rest of the, the nations and the empires that were in existence yeah. at the time, they were behind. Yeah, I had them ranked at a B. Um mainly because of their uh, cultural revolution with education and art being kind of the forefront of a lot of their later uh, endeavors. Um, I can accept to see, though, especially when we're comparing them to the more developed empires of the time. I will say that they were one of the fastest growing nations at the time. They were growing like 35,000 square kilometers per year. Uh, but again, that was largely unoccupied or, you know, nomadic spaces that they were claiming as their own territory. So so I could uh, accept that as a, a C rank. All right. C it is. And the next empire, the next empire is uh is the one that I think a lot of people were probably waiting for. Uh it's the Roman Empire. <laughs> the Roman Empire, not the Holy Roman Empire, the regular Roman Empire, the OG Roman Empire. The initial Roman Empire, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I have very few notes for this. Uh I I have no notes for this. So, uh <laughs> <laughs> um Started with Augustus, obviously, in 27 BCE. Um, do you want me to go through all the emperors in order? We go with Tiberius, we go Caligula. Oh, jeez. Oh, oh, um, I'm already <laughs> scared. I'm sweating already. Started in 27 BCE with Augustus. Lasted 503 years to the fall of Rome. Uh, obviously, I cut it off at uh, Romulus Augustulus. Uh, didn't go past there. Um, just kept it with the fall of Rome and kept the Byzantines separate after that. Uh Full extent under Trajan, uh, 5 million kilometers squared. Max population, 57 million, which is about 30% of the people alive at the time. So fairly significant. At, at, at certain portions of their existence, they controlled over 60% of the world's net worth. Um, I, I, I don't think there's a whole lot of uh, preamble I need to give for the reasoning behind my ranking here. I mean, they are probably have the biggest cultural impact of any society that has ever existed aside from maybe some of the Chinese dynasties. Mm -hmm. Um, and we just have so much record of everything from the Roman time period. Like it just, it's astonishing just how much we know about it. Um, and, and just how much it impacted what we do and everything we do to, d to this day, you know, from, from the calendar to, you know, uh, navigation to infrastructure to aqueducts to sewer systems. Like, there's there's no aspect of our life 
that doesn't have some form of impact from the Roman Empire. Toga parties. Um, yeah. So, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so for me, I mean, I think this is this is a, a clear S tier. Uh, yeah, I would agree uh, on S tier as well. Um, when you said, what did you say, Romulus was the, what, that one of the emperors? Romulus Augustulus. Romulus, Romulus Ag- Augustulus. Augustulus sounds like a plague of like the foot or something like that, but. <laughs> Um, again, I don't know why Star Trek is buzzing around in my head right now. That's the bad guys. Wow, well, yeah, the Romulus, Romulus. You know, is, yeah, is, yeah. <laughs> I'll give you that one. <laughs> maybe, maybe the maybe my Byzantine comment wasn't so uh, random after all. No, yeah, that's good. Yeah, S tier. I, I agree with S tier. I I didn't do any prep on this, knowing that you would have this base covered. I mean, my simple notes are basically massive multicultural hug, a uh, hub hug. Uh, founder of everything for politics to architecture. <laughs> so, yeah, I could go into great detail on it, but honestly, I don't see the point. I feel like most people that are going to be clicking on this or listening to this fully understand everything I would say. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Towards Rome, like you said, incredibly multicultural, developed modern forms of government. Um, yeah. Just, just changed the world in every way. Um, yeah, I, I just, I, you know, I, I tried to be, I tried to be, um, what's the word I'm, I'm looking for? Um, I don't know, uh, controversial or whatever going into it. I tried to be salty. I was like, I'll, I'll, I'll be that, I'll be that edgy guy that gives them an A tier. Yeah. General. But I couldn't, I honestly, yes, they had a lot of bad emperors. If you go through the Roman emperors or the list of Roman emperors, you have about 10 guys who, who were good. And then the rest of them you can probably slot into D or F tier. <laughs> yeah. Um, but those guys that were good were really, really good um, and, and did so much for the world. And those those time periods where they did have, you know, the five good emperors time period, for example, just, you know, um, Nerva, Hadrian, uh, Antoninus Pius, Marcus Aurelius, and, um, and Hadrian, or Trajan, were just that time period saw so much evolution in the world and the prosperity mm-hmm. of, of what the world would become. Um, can, you can kind of see the formations or the baselines of, of modern society forming during that time period. And it just, you know, it, it, it shaped the world. So for me, you know, as much as I would like to be that guy that doesn't just give them the S tier by default, they, they gotta be S tier. <laughs> All right, so on that Roman Empire note, um, I'm looking at the time here and realize that we've been going on for quite a while here, Jeff. So I'm thinking that this is going to have to be a two-parter now. So we'll uh, wrap things up with the Roman Empire. Uh, But uh, if you enjoy this tier list so far, hit that like button, that subscribe button, because we're going to continue on with the rest of this list. I think 25... Uh, empires is the list on this one uh and jeff you are obviously much more educated on the roman dynasties than i am so thanks for supporting your arguments so thoroughly and not giving me any reason to doubt it's why you bring me along (laughs) i appreciate it jeff i i really do so um if you want to see more of this stay uh tuned subscribe all that good stuff because part two uh will be coming out uh not too long after this one